back everyone to Cave Escape episode 10 and today we've once again invited Aaron Good, PhD candidate at Temple University in Philadelphia and teacher at a private Quaker school to uh, be interviewed with Paul and I and we're talking about a paper um, which he's going to have published in a book hopefully in the future, uh, The State versus Oliver Stone. JFK and Untold Histories of American Empire, and it focuses on Oliver Stone's work in particular, the film JFK, and the book he co-authored called Unt Untold Histories. And so welcome back to the podcast, Aaron. Thanks again for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. And the first question uh, I have for you is you focus on, obviously, uh, the film JFK. And at the start of the paper, you're talking about how um, it's, there's dramatized elements within the film, but there's also full of sort of facts which are essentially unknown to uh, the public or, say, the average, average person, the average man on the street who hasn't researched the sort of minute details of the assassination and the problems within the official uh, investigation and the official narratives. Um, and here we are in 2016, when there's been a lot of peer-reviewed academic literature, such as the works of Peter Tao Scott, for example, and I'm sure the works of many other um, respected historians, who've uh, in many ways completely taken apart the, the, the Warren Commission's report and how problematic that was, um, and all the holes and issues with it. Yet, despite that, despite all these revelations, all these declassified documents that came out in the in the 90s, um, showing that there, there are serious issues with this, with the investigation that, that occurred after the assassination. Why is it that there's still sort of an official taboo around the subject of, of whether um, JFK was assassinated by uh, some sort of rogue element within the US government or even it's even controversial to say perhaps the mafia had a hand in it so so why do you why do you think there's still this taboo well it gets to the question of uh, legitimacy of our most important liberal institutions um, our our democratically elected officials and our uh, our supposedly free press uh, the, the press played a very pivotal role in establishing the uh, official narrative right away. Um, very early on, uh, Dan Rather described the, uh, the, the film of the shooting, and he said, um, this was, I believe, the night of the assassination but, or, or the day after, but he said that Oswald, or that Kennedy's head could be seen to go violently forward uh, when he was hit by the, uh, the, the fatal shot. And anybody who's seen, you know, JFK or seen the, the Zapruder film knows that his head goes backward. And so, you know, right away you have very uh, questionable and uh, dubious statements made by media figures about this, about this event. And they um, have defended the the main narrative ever since, um, when, when Stone's movie, before it had even started filming, somebody associated with the production, uh, I believe, took a script and gave it to uh, reporters at the New York Times, and then they wrote pieces attacking the film before it had even started uh, filming, which is a first. Um, and I, I think that the besides just the press's, you know, the American media has some sort of connections to the world of uh, of U.S. intelligence that's been documented and never really fully illuminated. But besides that, they're also having to, they will also reflexively defend themselves as an institution. And so really to delve into it, not only are these, these media figures reflexively pro-establishment, or they wouldn't really have risen in the media establishment, but they are also kind of defending the the integrity of their profession when they when they uh, report on the subject, and so um, it's not surprising that by and large they adhere to the uh, official government uh, government narrative. Yeah, that makes sense, and I'm sure even if there were honest journalists who came in and looked at the archives, working for say I don't know the Washington Post or something, and realized. Oh wait, there was you know there was some sort of major cover up. Some of these journalists were either collaborating with or directly paid, being you know on the CIA's payroll, for example, to produce propaganda and whatnot. To come out and say, oh, 
the Washington Post was it was involved in this in this cover up of a great crime. Uh, it's just I guess it's further discrediting them and people go well why would we even read this publication then and trust in in sort of the mainstream media or governing media however you want to define it is at all time low I think around much of the West. Um, so, so that does make sense. And, and yet, you know, this, this taboo continues, and I believe it continues in a lot of academia, I'm sure. Uh, what do you think the average person can do to, to, to help break this taboo, to, to definitively challenge it in any way? Is there, is there anything we can do? Because there's the same sort of pressures I have. There's, there's an unconscious pressure even on me, I mean, formally studying uh, false flag terrorism or false flag attacks, right? Because it's by definition a conspiratorial activity, it's a conspiratorial phenomenon. There's, a, um, there's an awkwardness uh, uh, me being the only one, for example, in my department stu studying such a type of phenomenon, uh, you know, I, I can sense that there's an awkwardness there, and you know, it 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 it, it can make it difficult for me personally just to sort of um, just to talk about, like, stand up in front of the whole department and you know, give give talks on 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 my research. So, I mean, how how can we break or, or challenge this taboo? Well, I. I, the the trend that you point to about the declining perceived legitimacy of the media is uh, perhaps encouraging, and a number, you know, a small number, but a, sm a, a number nonetheless, of scholars have tried to uh, address these issues recent in recent years. Um, you have um, those two political scientists, Asimoglu. I think I mispronounced his name, but Asimoglu and Robinson, who've written some like important pieces that you all, that everybody studies for their uh, comprehensive exams, uh, if they're in a PhD program in political science, and uh, they are they've done some recent work on the Turkish deep state. Uh, so you have, I mean, you have the fact that the term deep state is now known by a lot of people. Um, you know, I first encountered it in the writings of Peter Dale Scott, and uh, I believe uh, around. The time that he wrote uh, *The Road to 9/11*, which would have been 2007, uh, I think that was published. And uh, since then, you know, it's it's kind of a, the term itself or the concept of it has has ex you know exploded, and it appeared in the New York Times. Um, I mean, I see it, I, I see it now to where I don't even necessarily make a note that I saw it anymore because I, I I've just seen it written more places. Um, it, there's a Another book by a guy named uh, Michael Glennon, I believe, called Double Government, and it also deals with um, it deals with this idea that we have below the, the our surface institutions or our, or our ostensibly ruling inst governing institutions, we have this other kind of more permanent, less accountable uh, form of governance. Now, as far as so, so there's some scholars who are working in this way, even if they're only sort of like around the edges of it, as you know. Um, like uh, there's another woman in public administration. I think her name is Janine Weedle, and she wrote um, she wrote a book I think called Shadow Elite, hmm. and that deals with these characters who are connected to private sector, you know, very kind of questionable enterprises in the in the private sector, but also work within government. And she calls them flexians, the people who uh, work inside and outside of government and to set up certain networks that are very unaccountable and maybe doing illegal things. So you have people, you know, some mainstream scholars who are kind of around the edges of these things and some who tackle them a little more directly. Um, but, you know, it's still kind of a, it's still a taboo area. As far as what the average citizen or the average scholar can do, uh, it's difficult to say. It's very, it's hard to write about these things and it's challenging because, so much is not documented, and also there's the sense that you must be that much more uh, exacting with your pronouncements and meticulous with your uh, sourcing of mm. material. So it's really, I mean, I know you know this because you've written about it. Uh, it's really a challenge to write about as a scholar, and for the layperson, you know, it's who has the amount of time to um, get to really come to terms with these things just to be able to understand them and speak to them about people because just to understand the standard version of history is very challenging. 
uh, to a lot of people. It takes a lot of investment of time just to understand the standard version of history and then to like actually look into the background of things such that you can, uh, you know, construct a critique of these official versions is, is, is more than a lot of people, than, than all but a few people can really invest. And so, you know, it's a, it's a conundrum. I don't have a, a really good answer for what average people can do other than to be informed and to reflexively doubt what the establishment media and uh, our, you know, establishment institutions tell us. Yeah, and I think they're sort of, uh, they're their own worst enemy, because in this in this wonderful internet age or information age, whatever you want to call it, um, if, there, if I do have a discussion or debate with someone online, um, although it is laborious to do the, the a lot of the, the research, I mean, having access to LexisNexis, I know I could just type in a few key words and come up with uh, decent, you know, reliable media reports on really sort of dark and conspiratorial issues, which seem uh, seem like they they would be fictional, like coming out of a Dan Brown novel, like in particular the Propaganda Due, that Masonic lodge in Italy, which was uh, at the core of a lot of these uh, a lot of these acts of terrorism and a lot of uh, just an extraordinary amount of corruption and basically having prime ministers in power. And I mean, if, if you read that in a in a fictional book, you'd probably say it, it, it's going a bit too far. And then, uh, unfortunately, you know, that was the reality in Italy for uh, at the very least half a decade. <laughs> um, so. Uh, I, I think the, the you know I, I would I would agree with you and I would also say from a from an academic perspective I think the emergence of the idea and terms such as deep state and deep politics and this this kind of study of the of the underworld and its connection to the overworld how they interact and how they can manipulate uh, politics of various countries international and domestic. I think it's it's really important, and there's so much resistance to it because since well, I I don't know I don't, I don't know all the ins and outs of academic history, of course, but there's a tendency to just focus on the the broader systems and structures in society and not not go into too much detail. I know in the political scientists and international relations, anyway, um, you know. And, and not go into the, the details of sort of individual net and the networks and the machinations and sort of power circles, if you will. Um, it's all about the structures and the effects and the influence of those structures and then the system that those structures are within, you know, whether it's capitalism or, or, or you know, anarchy and everyone's competing for power in, in, in IR, for example. Um, and going into the details of what these particular world leaders and the friends and sort of the, the groups of powerful people around them are really up to and what they really get involved in, which goes beyond those limiting structures where we think, well, there's checks and there's balances and there's this and there's that. And then you realize that, oh, well, they can actually, as Peter Dale Scott says, there's back doors to a lot of these structures that they can move in and out of. And uh, I think there's I, I feel like there's a resistance from even from critical scholars who take a more sort of broadly uh, Marxist approach or, or anarchist approach, which like to focus on, um, you know, the economic situation uh, or, or, you know, statism or whatever it is. Um, and there's something lost there by just focusing on that. And that's, I think, the, the, the real brilliance of reading work like Peter Dow Scott. And you're like, oh, my God, like, how how did this even <laughs> how did this take place? And there's a real um, deficit, I'm sure, in a lot of political science and international relation courses in, uh, I can imagine, most of most of most of the West, because there's it's not really taught. Right. I mean, uh, I know I know you're, you're teaching a, a private school, but in, in the courses, um I would have to inject particular issues when talking about, I remember both thinking back to my master's degree, thinking about US foreign policy and the fact that CIA and MI6 get involved in overthrowing states around the world, you know, like uh, Operation Ajax and overthrowing the democratically elected uh, government of Iran. And it's all about oil, right? I mean, it's, it's something that sounds like, I remember telling my students this, uh, teaching some of my students, um, uh, this year, in fact, first year students, and one of them says, like, oh, I didn't know I'd come to university and learn about conspiracy theories. And I was like, well, it's not. It's a conspiracy fact. So <laughs> go look it up. So I think don't take my word for it. <laughs> right. That, that is that that just the, the things that are already known about 
how the the CIA and uh, you know British intelligence also have operated there. Definitely, I mean, those are, as you say, conspiracy facts. I mean, they're, they're theories. If all history is theory, which you know I think you have to say that all history is theory, it's all the 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 facts that you have at hand and you incorporate them into some sort of scheme hmm. that try, you know tries to explain you know a particular aspect of history. And, you know, then that's that's a theory. And so if there are people who are conspiring in that in any version of history that you want to try to construct, that's a conspiracy theory. And all history is really theory. Um, and when the, looking at the, in, the intelligence agencies as a whole, especially the U.S., uh, in, when you're talking about the last, you know, 60 years, the, collectively, what they set out to do is, I mean, it, it says a whole lot about what um, the real uh, the real aims of the uh, you know the the, the American state uh, what those aims are um, because the the straight it's sort of a straight line in terms of who we are always attack we're always going after and what it was very often not communists or people who are explicitly not communists uh, like Mossadegh or like Sukarno and. The, the, the sin that they commit is to, uh, all, time and again, is so, some sort of nationalism or resource nationalism, especially, uh, attempting to assert control or ownership over the resources of their own, their own countries for the benefit of their own peoples. And, uh, you know, that's nationalism. And nationalism is kind of explicitly identified as an enemy by some of these elite uh, planning entities like the Trilateral Commission. The Trilateral Commission says in some of their early documents that, you know, our enemy is nationalism. And so I think that when you're thinking about the neoliberal order that exists now, you, you have to think about that and how it's a continuation of these other these things that we've seen all throughout the Cold War and which don't really change at the end of the Cold War. And, uh, the hysterical reaction to, to Brexit is, a, is an example of this nationalism being something that they're against. And you think, why are they against nationalism? Are they against nationalism because of, you know, Hitler being a nationalist and that leading to World War II? Or is it, uh, you know, that they would prefer to have nation states that don't really look out for the interests of the nation states and are more amenable to the prerogatives of uh, transnational uh, capital. And, that, and I think that explanation is the one that makes the most sense. It seems pretty self-evident, but... Yeah, definitely. I mean, especially when it comes uh, to... You know, what goes into maintaining that order is a, lot of, is a lot of sort of conspiratorial things in terms of what the intelligence agencies do. So the, cons the conspiracy is sort of woven into the, the political uh, economy of the world. Yeah, I think, you know, what I think that's a really that's a really helpful way of, of looking at it. And I think also that it helps, uh, especially I was going to say with examples like the overthrowing of Mossadegh and um, his sort of government, which just wanted to. Well, they're nationalizing British petroleum, which was named like Iranian oil or whatever at the time. Uh, uh, it was not in the interest. If you look, even if you were to take a particular like the dominant IR theory still uh, in Britain and uh, America, at least is the realist, the realist one where right, it's an anarchic world and each state is looking out uh, for its own survival and you know because there's no one power um, which can sort of come to your aid if you're if you're in danger. So it's a dog eat dog world and you have to, you know, do what you've got to do to survive and that justifies all this immorality and and whatnot. But if you look at something like that, that particular event, I mean, it was of no interest for the US and for Eisenhower, right, and the CIA. They didn't the US if you look at that as a as a nation state, it didn't enhance their security whatsoever, right? It was it was literally just protecting the oil revenues um, of lot of transnational capital, right? I think that it, it's it's just so obvious. And Peter Dale Scott writes about in the American Deep State that um, I believe he's he's talking about how these these operations came about primarily th through. Uh, British Petroleum, well, what was then British Petroleum, and other, and you, and you know, um, the, the cartel, if you will, the, the oil cartel, the Seven Sisters, as they were known, and you know, American interest as well, which then lobbied 
uh, Eisenhower, the CIA, to to sort of give the green light to this or or or, or you know go ahead with this. Like it, it wasn't anything that they needed to do, um, you know, to to get involved with. Uh, well, there was it was actually under Truman. It was under Truman that um, Mossadegh first nationalizes the oil. Hmm. Truman, Truman, who you know has a lot of has a lot of problems, but to his credit, he did not want to be another colonial power, and he felt it would have been wrong to overthrow Mossadegh. However, the Seven Sisters stage an embargo where they won't allow tankers to you know sell Iranian oil anywhere, and they manage to organize that successfully because they have a stranglehold over the world oil markets. And it, so while this is going on, they, so they basically start this operation to, to make Mossadegh's government fall before the CIA approves it. And, and the CIA starts to plan it even before Truman approves it. So they're, they're basically ignoring Truman and already starting to plan this operation. And then Eisenhower is elected. But he's elected in large part by, uh, you know, m money from the the oil the oil cartel and the oil interests. Um, he, he's a, a big beneficiary of them. His campaign is, and when he gets in there, he appoints corporate lawyers to state the uh, State Department and uh, CIA, the Dulles brothers, and they're of course you know Sullivan Cromwell lawyers, and they represent the biggest oil companies and the biggest corporate uh, you know titans <laughs> in America. And uh, then they uh, then they authorize the CIA to go ahead and and get rid of most of the day. And so the CIA hatches this great conspiracy and, you know, bribing. I think they paid the head cleric like $10,000, which wasn't really that much money to get the support of the, uh, the Muslim uh, clergy uh, in Iran to support the coup. And uh, they have a general named Zahidi that they get on their side. And they, uh, you know, that's what happens to Mossadegh. But it was, in, th in that case, it was the oil company started the process before the government had even, uh, before the official, the formal government had even okayed the operation. So that that's, and did it, and did it enhance the security of the U.S.? Well, it depends on how you want to define security. I mean, it, I think that the Seven Sisters thinking is even if only one of them is affected by the arrangement or the nationalization of uh, Iranian oil, which would have been the Anglo-Persian oil company or petroleum company, I think they were called, um, then, well, the, the, the problem, I think, for them also is the example that it sets, because if Iran is able to successfully nationalize their oil and develop their country and become more prosperous as a nation state, then, you know, that's, that's setting a bad example for the rest of the world to maybe follow. And so <laughs> these things become even bigger than the issues that they uh, – that they seem to be about on the surface. Yeah, it's it's really extraordinary. I mean, it's it's funny reading about this and looking back at it. Like the conflict of interest is so direct. Like you said about um, Eisenhower being elected with the money from oil interests and then appointing to the State Department and CIA, the Dulles Brothers, who are the Wall Street lawyers who were working, you know, as lawyers for some of these same um, organizations, uh, and obviously rings bells with Dick Cheney and his wife and their, um, you know, their positions in the, in the corporate world, obviously, uh, uh, with him being, he was the CEO of Halliburton, I believe, before he became vice president and his wife was on the board of, uh, a large armament company. I can't remember the, which one it was now. It was one of the, the big three. And um, you may remember Aaron, but, uh, it's, it's amazing seeing these, these families, and the conflict of interest is just so direct and so blatant and yet they're there and they get away with it and it's so it's so incredibly frustrating and it's sort of the fact that it's just continued on until until present day um and i'm trying to think of some british examples i'm sure i'm sure they are but there are quite a few too but it's it's just so extraordinary yeah the british examples with the uh the um, arms sales to Saudi Arabia, especially, I think those take off under Thatcher even even more dramatically, and how like sort of corrupting influence that has. Um, it, it's it, in the U.S. case in the in the 50s, we have Dulles, the Dulles brothers in there. Uh, the guy the guy who identified really what was happening was um, C. Wright Mills, and he identified in in his book The Power Elite, and one of the things he identifies as being a cause of this is that this perpetual conflict of interest, as you say, 
is that the U.S. has no civil service uh, exam. So there is the the leaders go back and forth between the corporate world, and there's really no way of identifying people who are the most capable or intelligent or you know maybe ethical. Um, instead, you have a system that's kind of the opposite, where uh, he calls it he calls it structural immorality, where it's you are not going to be able to achieve, you know, a greater position in the power elite if you are not capable of sort of serving their interests uh, at every position that you have, whether it's in the government or the military or the uh, or the private sector. And, you know, I, I think that that's he, he, that is a big a big problem with, the, you know, our liberal, quote unquote, system of government is that there is no way to to address these uh, this sort of systemic uh entrenchment of conflict of interest at every level yeah it's extraordinarily difficult and i remember seeing an interview with chomsky about this uh in a similar thing anyway and um i think he's a bbc journalist and they were talking about oh you know chomsky you think that there's some sort of um there's some sort of conspiring with which journalists are in positions of, of, of power in these in, um, organizations like the bbc and uh other mainstream ones um, around the world, uh, but he was saying actually this is this is really structural and it, and it's, but it's also based on just the particular stances and ideas you hold. So you know they they just won't hire someone who has a critical interpretation of the status quo. You just won't get to that position because they don't want people like you there. It's not a conspiracy. It's just you're seen in a certain light. Um, you know you're you're penalised for for writing in a certain way. Uh, it doesn't serve it doesn't serve their interests, especially when it's a, a private newspaper which relies on on um, revenue from advertisements from the biggest corporations in society. Right? That uh, <laughs> they just don't want you you writing pieces because it's gonna it's gonna directly it could directly impact upon their their revenue stream. <laughs> Right. And I even wonder today how profitable like these entities like the New York Times and the Washington Post are. I mean, with the Internet being what it is, I mean, how much how much ad revenue could they really generate or, or how, uh, in, in terms of actually helping their advertisers? Like, it would really be interesting to look at the, the funding and the way that these these uh, these entities operate, because uh, nowadays you do wonder, like, how does the New York Times even exist? I remember they tried to they tried to say you get a certain amount of free articles uh, a month that you can look at on the New York Times and sometimes I get close to the not that often because I really don't like the Times but sometimes I get close to that level where they won't let me read any more of their articles but I guess I would be not exactly the the median you know American consumer of news but I had to laugh at the idea of, of paying any money to the New York Times uh, to be able to read more of their their articles. Uh, so you know yeah that's that's a good point you know i'm sure i've read somewhere unfortunately i don't know the source of this but maybe even peter del scott talked about it but there's i'm sure there's a there's there's a small handful of these big uh, media companies uh, or paid newspapers which run at a loss but they're owned by billionaires who like the influence so it doesn't matter that they're running at a loss by 10 or 20 million dollars a year right that's that's fine to them because they'll make that from the interest in their bank accounts alone or something like that right but they just like the idea of owning a newspaper and having the influence I'm, I'm sure rupert murdoch right was, i'm sure some of his papers that he owned don't actually make that much money anymore but he's already a billionaire and he likes to be able to influence political decisions right based on his own ideas of, of, of how he wants the world to be, etc. Um, I mean, I know Amazon CEO, is it Jeff um, Bezo? Is that how you yeah. say? I mean, he owns the Washington Post, right? And Amazon has contracts with the CIA. They help uh, big contracts with the CIA to run their servers or something because that part of Amazon's profit apparently comes from owning huge computer servers, which, which um, well, you know, um, they run all these whatever software programs through and access to the internet. So it's a di there's a direct conflict of interest there for Washington Post, even though sometimes they do have some uh, very interesting uh, articles uh, about sort of stuff related to deep politics. I, you, you couldn't imagine them having anything actually critical about the CIA because um, that's going to jeopardize uh, the relationship that Amazon and, and, and you know, the Jeff, Jeff Bezos has with, <laughs> um, with them. Yeah, I mean, and that well, that was the case even before Jeff Bezos owned uh, owned 
the post. And that the, that's a good example because from what I understand it, Amazon has made a lot of money by – not made a lot of money, but they've become a large corporation because – they have they ha, they are so dominant in the field that they are in, but they've never been ext- especially profitable, as as I as I recall. But they they're this huge sort of entity that can w- keeps going along and acquiring sort of market share and so on. And I, I'd like to go look more into this because it's, it's I think it may be it's significant. But the, that you know that they are the sort of I've heard them described as the CIA's webmaster because of uh, their, their how close the relationship is between Amazon and the, and the CIA um, and of course they, they, they get all sorts of details about people because so many people can order you know everything from Amazon um, and so you know was the post going to be critical of the CIA well not, no not really but they they really weren't before then um, I remember, there's a quote from um, Catherine Graham where I, I, I believe this is in reference to uh, Contra around, you know, Iran Contra era uh, cocaine trafficking by the um, by the Contras and that she stated to she went to Langley to speak to uh, the CIA. Catherine Graham did. And that she and she said that there's just some things that the public doesn't need to know. And so, you know, that's the editor, or, 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 or I believe the editor of the uh, Washington Post. I know she was one of the top-ranking people there. I think she was the editor at the Washington Post. You know, supposedly when, or, or she was when Woodward and Bernstein, you know, supposedly heroically told the truth about Richard Nixon and broke the Watergate scandal and all of that. Um, and so, you know, it really makes you, it makes you re- her, see, hearing her say things like that makes you rethink about. You know what what the significance is of Woodward and Bernstein and Watergate, and uh, also you know that's kind of frightening if the editor of the Post doesn't mind saying that things like that. Aaron, what do you you know what do you go on the New York Times? What do you kind of what do you read for good news then in America? What's your news source? Uh, well, I guess I re- I, I social media, you know, especially Facebook. I have a number of friends who will post sort of interesting things from different sources. And so that's a good way to like get articles from different sites. I think some of the more consistently good sites are uh, Consortium News, which is run by Robert Perry. Um, and mm-hmm. he was a former Newsweek reporter who broke a lot of the stories on the Iran-Contra scandal. And eventually he basically was fired by Newsweek or let go because he was a good reporter and he he uh, dug up so many important stories about Iran Contra and I think that that did not please the uh, you know sort of powers that be at Newsweek and so he was let go and then he established his own so his own media outlet and uh, has been you know publishing things there for a long time. Uh, I also I like Counterpunch. Um, I go I go to Counterpunch a lot. Um, you know I. I We'll read. Our, I will look at RT to their headlines and some of their shows. If I'm gonna really, I think RT and this is this is very comical, but RT, which is Russian, you know, public television or whatever, uh, ends up being the best news network in uh, available in in the in on my cable. I don't, they're better than MSNBC or CNN or Fox, um, which is. Uh, that's just a real sad sign of the times, but uh, yeah, especially Abby Martin's Empire Files, right? That's really good. The mini documentaries he does about all those issues, which um, you know, a part of the untold history, I guess. Yeah, and uh, she's on Telesaur now. Uh, the Empire Files is actually on Telesaur. Oh, her right, show right. RT was was breaking the set, but I think her last episode was um, is on that just came out. On the, of the Empire Files is her talking to Peter Kuznick about uh, Hiroshima because Kuznick is an expert on the bombing, uh, the atomic bombings at the end of World War II. And I think he just lays out a devastating case for how gratuitous and uh, you know uh, unnecessary they were. Uh, I don't even really know that it's much of a debate after watching a lot of after watching Untold History and uh, you know reading his his work on that subject. But yeah, and Abby Martin will cover, give people like that, you know, a podium, whereas, you know, the U.S. mainstream media will not. 
it's quite interesting because uh, you know we after Obama's visit to Japan recently, the media here obviously, obviously covered whether he would apologize for Hiroshima and so on, uh, and it kind of seemed like the overwhelming opinion, and obviously this is how they reported here, was that he shouldn't apologize even, that it's not even really debatable if it's a war crime or not. And that was from, I think, even quite, you know, reputable papers like the FT. So is, is that, is that any way true? Is, is there, is there really a debate on a mainstream level there about Hiroshima or is it kind of, because to me it's plainly a war crime, you know, innocent people were killed, but uh, I don't know, is, is it talked about very much in America in that sense? Well, I, I've heard um, Peter Kuznick doing a number of interviews recently because he's been very busy after Obama's visit to Hiroshima because he's one of the top experts on the subject. And he said that according to a recent U.S. poll for the first time, a major poll showed that a majority of Americans believe that the uh, bombings were not justified, either not justified or not necessary. I don't remember the exact wording of the poll. So public opinion has changed a little bit on that. I think probably um, – Oliver Stone and Kuznick are as responsible as anybody for that uh, with their show on Showtime. Uh, and the, they've done a lot of screenings of the of the one episode of Untold History that deals with um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's called uh, The Bomb. If you haven't seen it, it's very good. But uh, so it, I'm not surprised that Obama didn't apologize. Actually, I would have been shocked if he would have. The guy has basically tried to um, – justify in different ways America's involvement in Vietnam, and he's made sort of glowing statements about Ronald Reagan in the past. Um, I think Obama has taken it upon himself to be a sort of emissary of American exceptionalism um, and will not confront uh, the myths of, um, you know, that go along with establishing this uh, idea of American exceptionalism. Yeah, but he's still regarded. I mean, over here we quite regularly debate Obama. He's obviously a massive figure, but yet he's still regarded as some sort of kind of peace envoy, somebody who, and this probably ties in with you saying, and I, I agree with it to an extent, but somebody who kind of is surrounded by a system that I won't let, that won't let him change anything. But my point of view of him is that I'm not so sure how much he does want to change a lot of the situation. You know, I think things like drone strikes and so on have just you know, increase under him, and he's under. He's actually taking direct control of drone strikes. Is it, what kind of view? What kind of viewpoint do you have on him and his kind of tenure now as president? Do you actually think that, you know, he did want to change, and it was just kind of deep state politics or the system or whatever you want to use, or do you think that he actually plays a bit of both to make himself seem good? I think that he is an establishment man, and uh, he they, they I. I didn't think this before. I actually had a job on his campaign staff in 2008, which I, I'm a little chagrined to say. Um, I think that he's not really – I think he's not interested in changing things very much. He didn't really try to very much, even on these big issues like his signature issue of Obamacare, the health care bill. He, he gave up the idea of a public option aspect to it very early on in negotiations. Uh, so I think that he was – he's really a neoliberal – and uh, he's he's interested in maintaining America's position of dominance in the world uh, and, and everything that that entails. You know, a lot of things that it, that it entails would be of questionable legality uh, or morality. You know, obviously. Um, so I don't I don't think he really ever did want to change things too much, and that he's not really trying to, because even if he even if he felt that he couldn't get things through Congress and so on. You still have a powerful thing as the president, which is the, the bully pulpit. You know, you can criticize th these bankers. You can criticize um, the our military overextension and so on. I mean, he actually has a lot of power if he wanted to take advantage of it. And there would be power even in saying, I don't have the power, but this is what, it, what how things should be changed. He doesn't make an effort to do that, and I think that's – very telling. Um, he's he's presided over an increase of inequality in America. Um, he bailed out the bankers. He did not jail any of them. That was not the only option available to him. Um, you know, he's the, the coup in Ukraine happened under his watch. The coup in Honduras happened under his watch. The destruction of Syria has happened under his watch. Uh, 
you know, Libya. It's a, he's got a, uh, I would say, a very unfortunate record for uh, people who would want to see international law sort of taken seriously and want a more peaceful, um, you know, international system. I think that Obama's not done anything in that in that regard. Although he's not, he's dialed back things on Syria, which I think Hillary would not have wanted to do, uh, and. You know, for that reason, I think he's, you know, that, that should at least be acknowledged that he's he seems to not represent the worst of the worst in the American political establishment. But he definitely represents the uh, American political establishment. Yeah, I find that hard because I, I, I obviously I, I want to like him just like you did at the start when you were on his campaign. And so on. But a lot of what he does sometimes does feel a bit tokenistic. So, yes, I don't think he's the worst of the worst. But I think a, a lot of what he says and does is, is, is for show as opposed to actual action, which is which is sad because it also means that people kind of believe that he has accomplished a lot. And I, I just really, I'm not so sure at all. I, I don't really, I don't really buy it as much, um, which is a shame. But I, I don't know if I don't know if I'm butting in here, Kieran, and you had you wanted to go back to what we discussed before. But I, I think that it, it leads on quite nicely to Hillary Clinton and, and and the current kind of campaign that's that's kind of engulfing America. It would, would Clinton, who's obviously, is she still favorite to, to win the election? I, I mean, it, would she be a continuation of, of kind of Obama? Would she be worse? Because obviously Bill was much more kind of active, in my opinion, in terms of neoliberal policies. I think that it, by judging by her record, she would be worse than Obama. Um, she it's it came out that she was really the driving force behind the intervention in Libya and that she has been behind a more aggressive policy in Syria. Um, I think that she could would be much more likely to take an even more confrontational um, posture uh, towards, uh, towards Russia. And Russia is a nuclear-armed power. Um, I think that it's very foolish for the U.S. and NATO to be pushing right up to the Russian border. Um, as other people have pointed out that this is the largest massing of troops on the Russian border since, uh, you know, the, since the Nazis. Since and, Nazis. That's, and uh, now, I mean, that's just that would seem to be a historical fact. That's not like hyperbole. Uh, and so, you know, what what exactly are what are what is it that Putin does that's so unforgivable to the Western political establishment that explains why he is demonized the way that he is? Uh, you know, and I, I think it's that. The emergence of Russia as a world power is threatening to, uh, you know, threatening the U.S. hegemony, and so he they follow the standard script, which is to demonize the leader, uh, to to turn him into a, an evil caricature, and so I think Hillary would be, you know, she would continue in that vein, and to what end? I don't, I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> if you've seen Doctor Strange Love uh, recently, and think about. You know the potential of a nuclear exchange that would seem so insane, and yet you cannot see how something like that could happen. Uh, it's it's sobering, and uh, you know I don't think that Trump is is um, any better. I really it's, I don't know who would be worse between the two of them, but uh, it, Hillary is in the lead as far as the polls go. I believe she has a a, a, a small lead, and um, you know I I think that she should be able to beat Trump. He seems to be the worst presidential candidate in U.S. history, and yet she is pro probably the second worst in terms of her unfavorability, you know, among the electorate. So uh, it, it, it's, I can't imagine a grimmer prospect than what we have now of these two people running against each other in the presidential election. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what, what is Hillary's track record that makes you so kind of unenthusiastic about her posture? Well, her the, her support, her wholehearted support of um, neoliberalism, free trade deals, deregulation, the finance. Uh, it was under Clinton that Glass Steagall was repealed. Um, the fact that she is endorsed by all the neoconservatives. I mean, she's endorsed by Robert Kagan, who is the one of the founders of the Project for a New American Century. So the, the neoconservatives and that particular group of them are probably the worst of the worst in American foreign policy, and she is definitely their candidate. 
Um, and that's really not, it's not good to think of them as being back in power. Obama sort of is on more of the realist side of American foreign policy. Uh, and, uh, whereas Hillary seems to be neoconservative. So that that aspect of her career is, you know, her record seems like she would be, it would be very troubling for her to be in there. She, you know, Robert Kagan is also the husband of Victoria Newland, who is the woman uh, who was passed, the, the deputy secretary of state who was passing out cookies to the protesters in Maidan Square during the coup uh, in, U, in the Ukraine. And was was caught on uh, on tape and on the telephone, telling you know, telling the Ukrainians who they needed to put in as the president. Mm. And uh, she said, "F the EU." If you remember that famous conversation, that was yeah, her. Yeah, yeah. And she talked Hillary. about how many billions um, the U.S. had given to the these opposition groups, right, over the years, like five billion dollars. Yes, yeah, five billion. Yeah, five billion. And she was set it in front of a uh, a Chevron logo. There's a, a backdrop behind her with oil company <laughs> logo. On it. So you know that's what they represent. And uh, you know Hillary's got the support of Wall Street. Wall Street basically throws, her, uh, you know, gives her millions of dollars just to show up at places and speak. If you've heard her speak, she's not an especially good speaker. I mean, I guess these things are uh, subjective, but, you know, I, I there's a few people off that I would like to listen to less than her. And I can't imagine, you know, why they would give her a lot, of, you know, millions of dollars to come and speak. Or well, I, I can't imagine, but but it's not to hear her speak. Um, <laughs> yeah, that reminds me of Tony Blair after after he stepped down as, as prime minister. He was he's got a cushy position with JP Morgan of a million I think a million dollars or even a million pounds a year as an advisor. I mean he's never been a banker, you know, you know, he knows nothing about banking, but I believe this the central bank of Iraq uh yeah. when uh, after the invasion was pretty much handed to um JP Morgan uh, acolytes so yes. uh, <laughs> you know but I guess yeah. makes, I guess that makes me a conspiracy theorist to thinking that there's anything in that right <laughs> <laughs> right I guess that would I mean it's these these sort of relationships are kind of unbelievable it's the uh, the, the just the the corruption that is so part and parcel of the uh, of the way that our political system operates and I you know Hillary and Bill represent that, the, the foundation, the Clinton Foundation that takes money from, you know, all of these governments uh, in, in the Gulf, for example, and uh, the Saudis, and, uh, you know, then then approves billion-dollar weapon sales to them while Hillary was at the State Department. Um, this this kind of, uh, of corruption is, which is now, I guess, legal in America, it would seem. Um, and so she, she represents... A lot of the things that would be the most troubling to me about the American political system, and I think to the to a lot of the rest of the world um, as well. So, uh, you know, I think that Sanders' campaign was encouraging that there were so many people, especially younger people, who were willing to listen to someone who called himself a socialist. Whether he was really a socialist or not is kind of debatable. He seems more like a New Deal liberal to me, but that but that is actually radical compared to the neoliberal, you know, uh, hegemony over politics now. Um, so what, what Hillary would mean as president is would judging by her record would be more wars and, uh, a doubling down on neoliberalism, uh, and all that that entails. So what hasn't been privatized yet, the, some of the schools in America and the post office, you know, she'd probably work work more on that end, and uh, you know, it'll be uh, America when all is said and done. People like the Clintons will be one giant company town. Yeah, I mean, it's it's quite it's really quite square, scary actually. I watched a, a documentary the other day. I don't know if you've seen it, Aaron, called The Clinton Chronicles. Have you heard? Have you, have you seen that? I think it, it. I believe it was made in the mid the mid early nineties. Is that um, was that done in part by um, that British um, reporter? Um, 
I'm not uh, uh, Evan. No, I, well, the document Ambrose, Ambrose Evans, Ambrose Evans Pritchard. I think. Oh, wrote a book he met, about yes. A lot of scandals related to Clinton. Yes, but. yeah. The documentary I think is is it's very similar as just how with Bill Clinton when he was the governor of, of Arkansas and what he did and a lot of whistleblowers who worked in his sort of power circle around him and it's really it's 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 almost unbelievable. Um, and it, it's a pretty good documentary. Not all of it's extremely sort of well documented, but um, some of it's just crazy and shocking. Not just the scandals with him sleeping with lots of women, right? I mean, um, but the the drug running that was going on, the potential links to the Iran Contra scandal that had as he was governor, um, the mysterious deaths of all these people who opposed him, the corruption within the, um, you know, the government there in Arkansas. I mean, it's really, really like incredible stuff. Uh, and I don't know when it came out, but you think a documentary like that, you'd think it just, I mean, I think anyone who watches it, you think you cannot have these, uh, anyone, you know, they talk about Hillary as well. I think there's an updated version as well, where it goes across um, sort of some scandals around Hillary. But Bill would likely have some sort of say, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, and it, yeah, of course. It just really, really worries me when you see a documentary like that, uh, like that. And it's it's worth a watch. It's really entertaining, yeah, I mean, the, gripping stuff. A lot of those things. There, there were, there were, there were, there was a right wing movement that was really uh, extremely anti Clinton in America, which is kind of ironic because Clinton really did a lot to. So advance and uh, really entrench like a lot of the things that began under Reagan or even take them further, you know? Hmm. Um, but he, but he, because of his association with the 1960s and anti, you know, an anti-war counterculture he, in the, in the American conservative mind, he was associated with these things. So there, there was kind of a, uh, a very um, almost hysterical counter reaction to Clinton but uh, that resulted in him being accused of all sorts of things. Now, that's not to say that there was not a lot of very um, shady business going on in Arkansas. I mean, I've, I've, heard, I've read some about the drug trafficking there, and it definitely seems like or it seems to be a lot of evidence that there was a connection to some of those Contra operations there. And there's also these the story of two kids who died on uh, supposedly died on train tracks, but it looks like they were they were murdered. Um, and it, and it seemed unlikely that they just fell asleep lying on some train tracks, um, which I think was the official story. And so, uh, you know, the, I think that that's those are the, you, anything related to those. Uh, those operations involving U.S. national security state and uh, drug drug running, or the or facilitating of drug running or the ignoring of drug running, like those things never get investigated. Yeah. None of that all points back in any sort of con, uh, a, a documented way to, to Clinton. You know, I don't know. I, I don't know. But um, hmm. you know, I mean, it's, it, it, is, it is. There's enough. There's enough there to be very alarmed about the. the the Clintons and what they've, you know, enough in their in their history to be very worried about what they represent. I mean, they got very, they have a, they didn't have much money going into politics, and now they're, you know, extremely rich. And you know, how do you get rich as a servant of the public? You know, that's that that question itself is is really uh, worth thinking about. Yeah, that's that's very true. Um, the one character who who popped up, who who I look um, with regards to this Clinton Chronicles, which I thought, oh my god, this is on blue. Is that Barry Seal, the that CIA um, pilot who was smuggling drugs in with a Medellin cartel, who seemed to be protected, and his operations uh, famously went to Arkansas, Mina, Arkansas, and this right. is, and that that was the connection. I was like, oh my god, this is this is ridiculous because. 
uh, that's an individual who's you know very much linked to hold the Iran Contra and um, George Bush Senior, right? And and it's just so crazy because <laughs> you have George Bush Senior and the Iran Contra scandal and the drug running, and then Barry Seal, and it looks like Clinton may have been at the very least, the very very least, turning a blind eye, you know, intentionally, consciously turning a blind eye and not letting the authorities in because there's video footage of Dr. Mention being questioned about the drug running, and he says this is a federal matter, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm the governor of the state, I don't get involved in this, and this he just kept saying that over and over and over again. Which seems yeah. like a pretty lame excuse. Well, I mean, he also could have been, you know, he could have been told by some aspects of the uh, federal government that he was not to intervene yeah, that's true. in a particular matter. I mean, he, he could, they're actually making a film on, uh, this, on Barry Seal, and it's going to be, I believe, starring Tom Cruise. And uh, <laughs> so that's, you know, that, that could be very interesting. I'm curious to see how they handle a lot of those issues. Um, the, the film on um, Gary Webb that came out a few years ago. Um, what's the title of that? The the, the movie that about Gary Webb, uh, about mm-hmm. Gary Webb. Yeah, I, I saw that actually. I can't remember the name of it. It was it was it wasn't too bad. Kill the, was mess, good. Kill the messenger. Kill the messenger. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I, I hope that this is as good as that. Um, and it's got a. I think it has a big budget. I mean, it's a Tom Cruise movie, so. Yeah, yeah, but I always, be, I always, I always worry when Tom Cruise is in films now because he's so deep into the whole Scientology cult, and uh, they seem to have so much control over their members. Just watching a couple of documentaries about that over the last few years, it's just so oh, bizarre. Oh yeah, they're really weird. Yeah, you're guaranteed some good kind of topless wall climbing or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, shots. I, I, he's been in some really terrible movies like Top Gun, uh, and you know. But I, I sort of, I, I, as far as big Hollywood productions go, I, I kind of like, I kind of like some of his movies in spite of myself, even though uh, it, it's not very highbrow. Uh, and I know the Scientology thing is very weird, but uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, it could be interesting. We'll see how it goes. He's, um, he's a so character. I mean, he's in, uh, he's in Oliver Stone's movie, uh, Born on the Fourth of July. That's a good film. Yeah. It hasn't worked before. I mean, there's a film, Whistleblower, which had Rachel Wise, a British actress. Um, and it was about the kind of a, a whistleblower exposed the UN creating uh, sexual, uh, sorry, kind of uh, sex slaves essentially in Bosnia, wartime Bosnia. So you would never expect the mainstream film like that to, to be so, so kind of uh, almost hard hitting and so on but it really was I was quite surprised you, I mean also it wasn't in a film Kieran with Matt Damon which you quite like where he narrates, where he narrates about kind of Wall Street and so on it's, it's a surprising amount of oh, films that's, yeah it's actually called Inside Job it's a documentary about the financial crisis it's a critique of why it happened and they, they actually they talk to a lot of these economists who are on the payroll you know they're meant to be independent but they're just on the payroll of Goldman Sachs and these other big banks and ask them why they didn't predict it and all of this and you know <laughs> It's quite interesting because those little gems do pop out, even though, you know, Matt Damon is quite, I'm sure he's got, you know, left leaning views or whatever, but let's say he's not exactly alternative in terms of what he produces. It's, it's quite funny when these, when these kind of films do pop out. It's possible. Yeah, he's a, he's a liberal. I think a lot of the guys in Hollywood are, are liberals. There's a handful of radicals, but, um, you know, people like Matt Damon and Ben Affleck are liberal. I think that they wanted to at one point make a film version of um, Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States. I don't oh, wow. think they ever did it. I don't think they ever did it, but um, they, they, they wanted to at one point. Uh, I, you know, it's but Hollywood. There's a book coming out by the same guy that wrote Kill the Messenger. I think his name is Nick Shaw or Nick Show. Um, and it's all about the CIA in Hollywood. And, uh, you know, I think that that's that role, that that element in Hollywood has always been very strong. And so I, I don't necessarily have a lot of faith in the, uh, in the Amina movie. I don't know that much about it. I think the movie about Barry seal. Um, but you know, there's, there's a chance it could be, it could be good. Uh, Hollywood's got a long tradition of working in, uh, or working with the CIA. They, the, the animal farm movie, if you've ever seen that cartoon from the 1950s, that was actually made by the CIA uh, they take Orwell's Animal Farm and they adapt it to the film because it's anti-communist, and they give it a more optimistic ending. 
Um, they were involved with Argo and Zero Dark Thirty. Uh, they did a version of The Quiet American years ago, the Graham Greene book, where they changed the ending so that the bombing is not done by, uh, you know, indirectly by the, the main character, uh, Pyle. Right, isn't the, that the guy's name Pyle? Um, he's played by Brendan Fraser in the in the later movie, but in the early CIA production uh, from the from the 50s, it, it's um, they changed the ending so that the the CIA guy or the intelligence guy is not really involved in anything sinister. <laughs> what a shame. So what, what we wanted to touch on something that I think is obviously very current. And I think your perspective would be really brilliant because you can kind of show us the more global, international view, the outside view, because you're caught right in this kind of whirlwind of, as what you said earlier, hysteria. What, what, do you, what is your kind of perspective on, on Brexit and, and you know politics globally and, and just even from the American side? You know, what's, what, what kind of effect does it have on you? Well, I, I think it's, it's not really clear cut exactly what Brexit is going to mean. It's not even clear cut whether Brexit will result in uh, Brexit or <laughs> you know, whether the vote will actually lead to Britain's exiting the European Union. Um, you know, to the extent that it became a right wing project, I think it, it kind of it taints the outcome somewhat. Um, you've got those guys like Nigel Farage who are so in favor of, of Brexit and um, What's the other guy's name? Uh, is it, uh, Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson, yeah, thank you. Uh, and so these these sort of disreputable characters who are associated with it, that is not that does not really uh, lend itself to optimism. But the uh, the fact that the U.S. mainstream media is speaking about this almost unanimously as though it's a terrible disaster, then you know, that's enough to almost just if that's all you knew, then you might think you might be forgiven for thinking that it's a good thing that it happened. <laughs> um, yeah. You also have the, uh, you know, the fact that it's that the EU was kind of an American project. And I think that it, it, it goes back to that that same sort of uh, elite, you know, economic elite, capitalist elite. Uh, fixation with minimizing and diminishing nationalism. Uh, Absolutely. It's actually, you earlier quoted us Mongoli and Robinson, and they've got a good book, a really good book, uh, I Had to Reach My Masters, about the EU and how it's funded. Obviously, the earlier kind of uh, kind of formations of the EEC and so on. And they actually explain that America used the Marshall Plan to fund these European projects during the kind of Cold War, I think it was maybe earlier, but to kind of create a buffer zone between Russia and Europe, uh, Russia and America, which is quite different to what we understand now as to what it is. Now we see it as a kind of peaceful, you know, uh, goodwill political union, which it wasn't. It actually started off as a financial institution, as you're saying. But it's also got a, that other political edge that it was actually meant to be an almost kind of block to, to save to save America from what they saw as the enemies. Yeah, and they did a lot of things like social engineering around that time. That was the using the Marshall funds for sort of covert means to influence society uh, and, and to last CIA operations. So they, I think that the Bilderberg Group was established in part as a result of that of some of those same funds. Uh, that were funneled to the the prince of the Netherlands, and so then and that was used in part to establish or strengthen the the, the what became the Bilderberg Group. Um, I think the the they, idea of a single currency came out of the build like a Bilderberg Group meeting before it came been like came into the mainstream. It was this. <laughs> I think that's pretty much on record. I'd have to double check it, but I'm, I remember reading quite mainstream articles about that, which is quite sinister, right? Because the politicians and business elites meeting in secret are like, right, we need this one currency for 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 the, all of Europe, and we're going to try and you know get it through. And they talk about you know the ways they can get it through without democratic processes. It's so sinister, it's unbelievable. <laughs> right, and uh, you know, I think that I was just reading about how I think that the uh, the Trilateral Commission emerged in part 
from Bilderberg meetings. Uh, I, I, it's possible I'm misremembering that, but I think that's in Kuznick and Stone's Untold History where they're writing about the Trilateral Commission, and it comes out of that. And so, you know, it's kind of sneered at to, to look at these elite organ entities and, and how they, you know, influence society. Uh, I believe it's also pretty well documented that the at, at this point that the oil crises in the in the 70s were discussed before at a, at a Bilderberg meeting. That, oh, wow. Um, I didn't know that. that That's they crazy. basically laid out the scenario of what would happen and the consequences. And then it happened, you know, almost exactly the same the same way. And it's worth noting that the oil crises really redounded to the advantage of, you know, Western uh, finance capital, uh, that, that all of that, they had worked out deals with those countries so that even when they raised oil prices and they supposedly were really sticking it to us, that it made the oil companies a lot of money, but it also made, it also, all that money went back into the Western financial system. And it was, you know, discussed more or less at a, at a Bilderberg meeting. And so I think that those same the, the EU represents a project of those those same elites uh, that have you know foisted neoliberalism on all of us and uh, and so it's you could almost be happy for it to fail just based on that that but what, whether that mean will entail a lot of suffering for the the British people in the long run I don't I don't know um, yeah, I think that it's it's too complicated to see what what's gonna What's the result? What the results will be, and how it will affect them and the economy, and how the global economy does anyway. Um, but it, it's it, it if it could possibly allow England and other countries to have a more independent monetary policy, which England already does. England really isn't a full-on EU member. Uh, they're, they're not. They haven't adopted the 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 um, the euro, right? They they still use the pound, and um, so. They aren't really getting the worst of it, but if, you know, perhaps it could end up being a positive thing if it makes the EU less of a bloc that's totally dominated by American interests or Anglo-American interests, and that these countries start to look out for their own sort of national interests in a way that it evolves in a sort of social democratic, you know, direction rather than a uh, well a fascist direction, which is, I think. Most most of us would agree that the fascism is not uh, encouraging if it, if it develops. That's quite interesting because I've always had the kind of view that the EU was dominated by individual member states trying to get what's best for them and not combining very much at all. Of course, when they combine, it can be for transnational reasons and things like the TTIP deal or TTIP, whatever you want to call it, are proof of that. But I kind of I always felt that it was quite a a complicated mix of both transnational and nation state self interest. But do you, do you have a different point of view, or do you kind well, of? I think I think that you are a, you are that that's that it is a combination of, of those things. I think you're right. And Germany seems to be the dominant economic force in the EU, and um, you know their what what they've done to Greece is uh, you know. I think important to recognize, and uh, if the way that these law rules are set up with them, and, and their, the amount of deficit spending that they're allowed to have, and the only way that they can, you know, finance things is through taking out more loans and so on. And then if Greece is actually forced to sell off everything of value to try to pay bondholders, you know, who are mostly German German banks and such, then you know that is a case of of a national interest being exerted, but it would also make Greece, a, you know, a place that Americans would make, American capital would make a lot of money too. If, if things are sold off at fire sale prices, then um, that would be advantageous to uh, American, you know, transnational capital as well, not just German capital. I heard uh, Michael Hudson say that when that part of what happened with the Greek restructuring deals was that they had these rights to gas, oil and gas reserves in the, in the Mediterranean or in the Aegean Sea, and that they put them up for bidding, and that the company that bid the highest was actually uh, Gazprom. And so when they found out that it was a Russian company that might take control of it, they actually axed the plan to, to privatize those. So uh, that's interesting to see the way that it, 
it it works in terms of uh, you know national interests or geopolitics being asserted in, in different ways, even if it's it's a little unusual and not quite totally straightforward. Um, that it still functions as a it's neoliberalism, but if it's if it comes down to neoliberalism versus sort of Anglo-European, Anglo-American hegemony uh, over these areas, then that'll be privileged over over the commitment to neoliberal ideas. So, I mean, do you, do you think then that this is this could shake up even the American establishment in a way, or do you think it would be just a small, a minor kind of infraction on their usual policies? I, I you know, uh, I think that. I heard an interview with Daniel Ellsberg uh, recently. It was a pretty long part interview, like a few, like hours long, and he was talking about the Cold War as be that a, a poorly understood part of the Cold War was that the West, especially Anglo Anglo US uh, elites, were really concerned with not allowing East West trade, so not allowing Russia to trade much with the um, with the Western with Western Europe. And the guy who founded Stratfor also said something very similar. He said that really the primordial interest of American foreign policy in Europe is the relationship between Germany and Russia and that they have to be kept, you know, in, on opposing sides at all costs. And uh, if you if you think of it that way, then a lot of these then the importance of the EU as a bloc and as an anti-Russian bloc uh, is is then it makes you know it kind of makes more sense that the 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 West, especially Britain and America, are trying to keep Eurasian integration from from taking place or, or from happening in a way that's not beneficial to U, Anglo U.S. interests, and so uh, you know the EU can be can be thought of um, in that way, uh, and I, I I think that makes you know. It makes a lot of sense uh, to me that, that because if you look at the map, you know, look at America and look at Britain, how can these two countries have such a dominant position over over the globe? You know, and it, it, it must require a lot of maintenance of these political relationships to, to, to keep that as a, the status quo. And I think that the that it may be shifting in a, in a way and that the U.S. and, the, and the, a lot of the ways the war on terror has been waged. But these are all done to uh, kind of forestall uh, the emergence of a rival, rival power, a rival power structure, and to you know hopefully establish another American century like they say they want to establish. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, we were also mentioning earlier Erdogan, the president of Turkey, and how he's now apologized to Russia. Very timely apology it is uh, for the shooting down of the Russian plane. I mean that also kind of tells you that that there are now slight shifts geopolitically which could actually have major implications in the future it seems like in my opinion that that Erdogan kind of chose this time because with the EU possibly facing failure he is now looking for different allies yeah he had had as one of his goals to join the Shanghai Cooperative Organization before all of this business in Syria transpired and uh, somehow I don't know if the US told him that he had to do these things in Syria, or if he thought that he might be able to have points in the region there himself, uh, perhaps a combination of the two. But now, you know, they're a part of NATO, but they may actually try to join the Shanghai Cooperative Organization. It seems like a, a, shortly after Erdogan made that apology to Russia that uh, there was a big bombing in in uh, yes. Istanbul right away, which is, I don't know what to make of that, but it's interesting. Yeah, very true, and I think that together. He's got a he's got a very interesting situation, and he's he seems to be quite the negotiator as well. I know the, the EU is he was you know quite vehemently negotiating in terms of whether he should accept the Syrian refugees or not, and trying to get some concessions in return. I mean, I'm not a fan of him in any sense, but he's I think he sees himself as holding a quite good position from which he can hopefully gain quite a lot. Yeah, they're an, they're an important pivot point between, uh, you know, between Europe and the Middle East and Russia. Um, I think that he can parlay that into uh, some amount of power. But, you know, Turkish politics are really dangerous. Uh, that's 
I mean, they've had that important position for a long time. That's why some of the, the shadiest things in politics, uh, international politics, have gone down in Turkey. Uh, if you, you know, study the deep state and Gladio and all of that, um, I mean, the deep state is a Turkish term because the Turkish deep state was so pronounced that, you know, that's they they, got, they needed a word, a term to describe it. So uh, I, I would be there's a lot going on there. There's this that group of Muslim cleric. There's the Muslim cleric. Um, what's his name? Uh, he's in the U.S. and he has a lot of charter schools. Um I, I wish I could. I can't recall his name at the moment. It's, it's um, but but he he's a, basically a fifth column in in Turkey of uh, and, he, and he's connected to the CIA. His visa to come over to the U.S. was signed by um, I think Graham Graham Fuller. Hmm. Is it the Gulen and, the Gulen movement? Gulen, yeah. yeah. Fetula, Fetula Gulen. That's yeah. his name. Yeah. And. Uh, you know, so this is that that there's been purges in recent years of the, of different uh, constituencies or contingent contingencies in the uh, in the Turkish political establishment. There's many things going on over there, and uh, I think that he'll Erdogan is trying to see which way the wind is blowing and adjust accordingly, uh, which is about what you'd expect him to do in that position. Uh, and yeah, he does seem to be kind of unscrupulous in, in general, <laughs> but uh, that kind of goes without saying, I guess, in politics. Uh, I'm not sure if you have any questions, Kieran, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just about finished. No, no, no. No more direct questions, but yeah, I was just going to chip into the, the sort of geopolitical shifts in the world, and um, it's interesting that I think it's there's certain signs that's even impacting uh, the so-called special relationship, the, the, the Anglo-American power structure. There's a lot of tension when the UK decided to join the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which was last year, is one of the founding members. Uh, and obviously it's led by China, and it's, it's I believe it's sort of like their equivalent of the IMF there, um, and it, it's going to be funded heavily by them. And there's a lot of pressure, and it came out publicly, a lot of pressure um, from the US not to join. Canada didn't join, Japan didn't join. Um, but the UK, Chancellor Osborne, he actually sort of broke ranks and said the UK would be applying and is going to join this and I think some some I don't know some generals in the Pentagon pretty much came out and said uh, you know uh, we believe this is not the way to to uh, deal with a, a sort of an emerging power basically something along those lines um, and so and with Saudi there's been tension between uh, the US and Saudi Arabia as well in in recent years and a lot of it sort of uh, came out around the whole declassifying of those documents um, that are 28 pages, right? So there's some real, there's some real tensions there. And uh, I, was, I just quickly read that, um, well, there's a report by a very establishment think tank, um, Chatham House in, in England, and it's, it's the equivalent of uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, essentially. It's one of those type ones in, in the US. Uh, and, uh, and they said that the UK sort of broke rank with the G7 pack, um, to join this this investment bank and after they did uh france and germany and italy they they sort of followed suit and it says only only the us and, and japan and canada sort of remain outside it now from the west so we can see these these shifting the i mean obviously i'm not sure how much real tension that does cause but um yeah there's, there's definitely a lot of shifts in world politics over the last uh, well since the financial crisis right it's become very a lot more fluid Yeah, I, I, the Saudi thing is fascinating in that, you know, the um, I think that the Saudis were were more or less told to ramp up oil production, and they've had that role in the past to sort of crush people, uh, companies that th that were threatening maybe OPEC's uh, dominance of uh, the oil markets, uh, and I think that the U.S. sort of had them reprise that role and told them to. Uh, pump a lot of oil and crash the price of oil. I mean, I, I don't really believe that they're doing that for market share. That was the mm. explanation that was floated in the U.S. press. And I, I, they, they, it's destabilized the, the, uh, the government to some degree because they rely on these. They, I mean, they've actually they ended up pumping so much oil that they reduced their oil revenues because the price went so low. And that doesn't seem like a like a rational uh response based on what would seem to be their own national interests. I, and 
it, it but as it has damaged uh, the economies of Russia mm-hmm. and Venezuela and Iran, and uh, you know those are all like important uh, goals of uh, U.S. foreign policy, and they've had in recent you know in, in the last year or so different reports of discussions between the Russians and the Saudis on Syria and on oil negotiations on oil production. And at the same time, you have these things emerge about the declassification of those, you know, the 28 pages, as they're called. And so, you know, what's the real, how are these things related to, uh, you know, is this something that could be used to potentially uh, get rid of the Saudi regime uh, if they outlive their usefulness? which um, seems like at some point they will. They're such an odious regime. Uh, the U.S. relationship with Saudi Arabia really belies almost every pronouncement we make about uh, human rights or democracy or liberty or really, I mean, just about anything. They're, they're such a, a horrendous regime. I mean, they, the way that they deal with dissidents is like, uh, it's like Game of Thrones or something. They, uh, one guy was, is slated to be uh, beheaded and then they're going to crucify his body and sew the head back on and put it out for public display. <sighs> <somewhere>. It's medieval, <laughs> so, isn't it? Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it's it's it is unbelievable. And so, you know, what what's going on with the house, the house of Saud and uh, the U.S. the U.S. establishment? I don't know, but they've definitely been instrumental in uh, crashing the price of oil. And uh, I think that the that the U.S. was probably involved in that to some to some degree. Yeah. Do you know the one really, the one really beautiful thing we get out of this, and this is obviously it's the same relationship that Britain has with Saudi Arabia, selling weapons, buying the oil, and there's this that that, that cycle of the money as well, and they invest huge amounts into property and into London. And um, the one beautiful thing is because uh, every time I discuss issues with friends or family members who talk about international politics and they try to bring in sort of the morality of what Russia did in Ukraine and stuff, and I I always just say. Do you know who one of the strongest alliances are with the Middle East? Uh, right? I just remind you that Saudi Arabia is one of the most vile regimes on the planet. Uh, and they're not just protected, uh, they're, they're military officers. So many of whom get trained in Britain, in Sandhurst, right? Teach us special forces how to counteract resistance movements. We sell them the weapons they use against their own people, right? Uh, and it's it's just gross. It's disgusting. And I love, I, you know, that's the one beautiful thing is because it show it can I, I use it as a tool, you know, as a weapon to show to everyone who tries to claim there's any morality going on and the fact that, you know, they're trying to penalize countries like China and Russia for slight infringements of, of something. I go, well, you know, we're just as bad. Do you know, what, you know, do you know who our allies are? <laughs> yeah, do, you, do you recall the story of, uh, I hope I get the details right, but it, it was, I think, BAE and weapon sales to uh, Saudi Arabia and a, a, a lot of bribery. Uh, that was alleged to have occurred on the part of the Saudis bribing officials and such, uh, British officials related to these weapon sales, and that the Saudi ambassador or a prince said to, uh, communicated to the British government, maybe to Tony Blair personally, that, you know, if he kept investigating this, the Saudis couldn't guarantee that there wouldn't be more terror attacks in. Uh, in yes, in, you're right. In, that was recently, wasn't it? Yeah. So this is, uh, I mean, I that's an amazing story. I, I it wasn't really picked up that much in the U.S. I yeah, mean, it was a serious fraud office in the Britain. Why those stories are generally ignored. Yeah, they, it was just direct political yeah, pressure. You're right. So, they they came out and said, "Well, we're not going to share intelligence with you if you continue with this, and you may have some terrorist attacks that are coming at your door." No, they, they literally yeah, said there may, said, there may be another seven seven. There may be another terrorist yeah. attack in London. I was like, "Oh my god." <laughs> Yeah, that's the equivalent of saying, you know, uh, nice, nice little country you have here. It would be a shame if anything happened to it. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's kind of it's astounding. Um, but yeah, there there it is, and uh, it's. I guess all we can really do is grab some popcorn and watch this this stuff unfold. Sadly, uh, it's, there's not it doesn't there doesn't seem to be much that we can do about these big geopolitical shifts. Perhaps the one encouraging thing is that. Uh, the the complete dom the predominance of this of the uh, of the U.S. Western bloc seems to be diminishing, and that can be that could either lead to war or it could lead to an even worse system. There's a possibility that it could lead to uh, 
you know, a more multilateral system where uh, international law serves to sort of establish what's acceptable because the powers are, you know, more or less on, uh, uh, they have more parity with each other. Uh, so, you know, that may be what we're witnessing now. Yeah, and the refusal of people in, in the UK and the US over the intervention intervention in Syria over any over intervention, right? I mean, in, in Parliament in the UK, it was the first time they ever voted down uh, an act of um, um, an act of sort of military aggression, basically, and it, or pretty much in like a, its history, which is really incredible that it, it came to that. that. The government has lost it anyway. There was a there was a vote and there was rebellion over. I think that's in 2013 now when the chemical um, weapons and them being used and civilians by Assad, etc., and, you know, the, the actual politicians said no. And there's a lot of pressure from the anti-war movement in Britain. A lot of people who realize, oh, my God, what Britain's going to get involved in another country in the Middle East with America again. And there's a lot of pressure to just, you know, you, this cannot happen again. There's going to be rebellion. Right. <laughs> right. And in the U.S., it was like something like 90 percent of the of the phone calls received by uh, congressmen were uh, against the uh, U.S responding to the alleged use of chemical weapons by the uh, Syrian government. So I, I think that it's happening in the U.S. as well. Um, you know, I think it's harder to get things done in the U.S. electorally, uh, but, you know, that, that is encouraging that they, that somehow that breaks were put on that because it would be, I mean, it's already a disaster. It's already a big part of the reason for the immigration problems in the EU, that Libya and Syria. And, uh, you know, I think that should be recognized when people look at what's going on with Brexit and these other countries that want to leave the EU and these immigration crises is that they have a pretty clearly identifiable cause, which is, you know, Western intervention in the Middle East. And that's it for this episode of Cave Escape. I'd like to thank Aaron and Paul for being with us. And Aaron, hopefully we'll see you again in the future and we can interview you more about the U.S. elections, which will be taking place in November of this year. We've had an extraordinary year so far for politics, and I have a feeling it's going to get even more bizarre, even more crazy, and even more interesting. So thank you very much, everyone, and bye for now.